Okay, so I thought I'd wrap up the lectures by talking about a very modern approach that's uh, getting used a lot in computational neuroscience, uh, sometimes called reservoir computing, uh, training recurrent neural networks, uh, liquid state machines, echo state machines. And the general idea is that uh, you have a large network of connected probably rate neurons. So the equations would look like sort of population rate equations that we've derived of excitatory and inhibitory neurons that are uh, coupled together that really produce high dimensional dynamics. And so uh, you, you really cannot um, describe them with uh, always with just low dimensional, low dimensional uh, systems. You would miss something if you did that. And uh, you can essentially train either the connectivity weights within the network or weights uh, going from inside the network to out to some sort of readout unit, as we'll discuss. Um, and the idea is that in training those weights, the network can learn to use uh, inputs from the past to predict uh, future uh, inputs that it might receive, or it can just you you know just take inputs from the past and store some bit of information about them, or use that information to compute some relevant quantity. And uh, the idea with uh, high dimensional uh, coupled networks of neurons is that uh, if you add uh, some of the really interesting features that you find in actual neural networks like um, adaptation, short-term plasticity, long-term plasticity. You can really represent um, uh, dynamics of inputs at multiple time scales. So both a few milliseconds representing uh, you know, changes in firing rate, action potentials, up to the hundreds of milliseconds of uh, inherent properties of single neurons like adaptation or sh short-term plasticity, um, all the way up to long-term plasticity. And many people uh, ha have done this, and uh, that, that work even uh, precedes the, the work we'll primarily discuss here, um, and that, that's cited in the book. Um, but uh, the, the names I, I described really call to mind the fact that you have this high-dimensional system that you can provide an input to that will respond in some complex way and do some kind of computation. So the idea is that you, you, you have a reservoir that is rich enough that it can do all different types of computations um, on temporal dynamics, uh, dynamics that change in time on your inputs. Uh, the, the idea of calling them liquid state machines uh, originates from the fact that if you have um, an actual liquid that responds in some complicated way, it can actually do uh, computations, like the idea of dropping pebbles into water at different points in time. You can learn something about uh, where and when those, those pebbles were dropped into water if you look at where their uh, ripples intersect. Um, and echo state machines, the idea is similar, like, like sound waves from, from echoes. Uh, sort of interfering with one another is similar to the way that um, multiple inputs would interfere with uh, one another, and and they're all, they're also their past um, their their past instantiations interfere with one another within these high dimensional networks. Okay, so the example that we're um, going to take is just one that's lifted from the Gerstner book. Uh, this is. Uh, a network of uh, 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 several hundred neurons where 80% of them are excitatory and the rest are inhibitory neurons. Uh, there's randomness in connectivity. You have short-term plasticity and different uh, time constants uh, of the membranes of, of the spiking neurons. And so um, the idea here uh, that they used, which is um, similar to what other people have done, is to uh, provide inputs to this network. Uh, one input is presented to 
uh, let's say one neuron here, another input is presented to another set of neurons, another input is presented to another neurons, and the inputs are, are essentially just spike trains, and so they're they're integrated by these linearly uh, leaky integrating and integrating fire neurons that make up the network, and then the uh, spiking activity of these neurons is uh, weighted, added up in some way, and then and then read out uh, through an output. This v uh, this this new online, and then there's also some uh, memory, basically of the current state of the network that gets re-injected into the network. Okay, so there's a sort of readout uh, uh, neuron population uh, new mem here, and so the idea is that um, these uh, streams, say streams one and two, new one and new two, are Poisson spike trains. Uh, most of the time, they have some low background firing rate. Um, and occasionally they have some high firing rate, and um, the what what Moss et al. did is they they really just trained the the weights uh, to uh, eight neurons in the network originated from eight neurons in the network uh, to reflect uh, in in that output okay whether the last burst okay came from stream one, so whether new, new one has been highest, uh, higher sooner, or whether new two was higher sooner. Okay. If you look at the time series for new three and new four, they, they don't look quite like that. Uh, they, they essentially look more uh, random, sort of less, less orderly than new one and new two, that just have this sort of up-down uh, feature to them. And the idea is that if uh, stream one, new one, was most recently on, another readout would compute uh, the sum of streams new three and new four, like the sum of the firing rates, okay? And they would compute their, sorry, it would compute their difference um, if uh, stream two had been on most recently, or firing at a high rate most recently, okay? So, so the point is not so much understanding the details of all these uh, calculations, but the, the point is is that you know this is a fairly um, complicated calculation that depends on time and depends on the importantly it depends on the history of time, right? You could not do this with a simple feed forward neural network because uh, those that we've looked at don't really have any temporal dynamics. It really matters that, this network can hold on to a memory of uh, previous events in time, okay? Even as far back as many, many time units, okay? So how does it do that? Well, it, it, it does it through the recurrent connections of the network. A recurrent network can, can sort of maintain memory, as, as we've seen before in simple networks, and also the sort of re-injection of the, of the memory readout, okay? And how were the weights uh, coming from these eight different representative neurons trained? Uh, well, it was done uh, using something like gradient descent on the air. So, so uh, I update these weights so that it uh, reduces the error between the desired output, which would be that uh, I have the um, I have the the memory stream is basically um, uh, one or zero. Okay, or high or low, if uh, one or two was mostly recently active, input one or two was most recently active, and um, the output uh, should be trained so that I either get the sum or the difference of new three and new four if the memory output uh, was was most recently active. Okay, and the important thing is that the memory output is not actually um, uh, is not interacting with the online output, but but somehow the fact that the memory output gets reinjected in the network allows the network to have enough information to sort of properly tune the the sum or difference output. Okay. Another point is that this is supervised learning, and so this training is not really physiological. Okay. The closest thing to sort of physiological supervised learning would be like you know reward based learning that we've talked about based on dopamine signals, okay? 
But there's a lot of knowledge that some of these supervised learning training protocols have that are not really reflective of what's happening in the brain. And so there's a lot of ongoing research to sort of bring together um, these uh, more kind of engineering-like, computer science-like approaches to training neural networks and, uh, and biological realism. Okay, so that, that's a gap that still needs to be uh, better bridged, but um, people are getting there. Lots of, of current research on that. Okay, and so after the network is trained, uh, this, uh, these four different windows of time series show the result. Okay, so the top panel is really just a, a, a screenshot of a, a time series of 100 neurons in the network. And uh, we can see that when the uh, the actual uh, when actually the the input uh, new one goes up, okay. If we look at the 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 bottom panel of this, we see that new one goes up sort of first, new two goes up later, and then new one goes up uh, later on. So the shaded gray. Uh, rectangles in the middle two panels represent places in time where new one was most recently the the highest most active um, input out of new one and new two and we see in this case that the memory readout okay goes up when it should in the first gray bar and it goes down when it should once new two goes up and then it goes up again uh, when when new one bursts again, okay? And along with that, okay, the online readout that's telling us about whether, um, telling us either the, the sum of new three and new four, or the difference of new three and new four, okay, is represented in the third panel down. We see that in the um, dark, uh, the, the black curve essentially, we get uh, new three plus new four in the shaded region. And then when we get back into the white region, uh, it falls down towards uh, the, the value equal to the difference between new three and new four. And then it goes back up again in, in the later shaded region, okay? So the training worked. The point is that you, you, you can train uh, these, these neural networks or re reservoir computers to do these sort of complicated non-trivial calculations. Okay, let's look a little bit closer at <clears throat> the random networks that we're using to train these types of dynamics. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how the, the underlying matrix of weights between neurons in the networks shapes the dynamics uh, that that uh, network will, will initially have. Okay. And so here's a set of equations representing how the rate xi of the ith neuron is going to change um, as a function of the network. Xi i here is um, just a bit of noise in the network, Gaussian uh, white noise. G is going to be some uh, nonlinearity, like it could be a heavy side or a hyperbolic tangent, it could be a, a, a rectified linear uh, function. And this summing of the weights Wij and Xj represents the connectivity of the network. And we're really going to focus on how this connectivity of the network shapes the, the stability of different steady states in the network. And in particular, if G of 0 is equal to 0, as it is in the case of hyperbolic tangent, rectified linear functions as well, then what we have is a steady state uh, solution, which is that xi equals zero for all of the i, um, as long as we have no noise in the network. So if we take the noise in the network to be zero, okay? And the reason we want access to that is we, we want to look at um, uh, what, what happens to the, the general dynamic, are, are the general dynamics of the network attracted to this fixed point or not, okay? And what we find is that uh, it, we can compute the stability of this uh, of this fixed point, as we do in you know two by two systems. But now we have like a you know a large n by n system. And the idea here is that I've just written down the eigenvector eigenvalue equation for perturbations to uh, this 
this steady state solution. And so um, the eigenvalues, okay, are given by uh, tau lambda v, where v is this eigenvector, equals to minus the identity. That comes from this xi minus xi here out front plus g prime of zero w, which comes from linearizing the, the nonlinearity here, acting on the weights in xj. And we can see here that um, really it's the, just the eigenvalues of w that are, that are largely gonna determine the, the stability of, of the network, okay? And for what follows, we'll assume that g, g prime of zero is one, okay? So the steady state of the whole network is going to be unstable if the um, re, uh, the real part of lambda is greater than zero. So we'd like to really look for when g prime of zero times w has um, eigenvalues with with a real part that are contained, let's say, within um, the the interval from minus one to one. Okay, and so um, one. Uh, very uh, useful piece of work that did that is a paper by Kanaka Ranja and, and, and Larry Abbott. And they looked at, uh, in particular, a network that uh, uh, has a combination of excitatory neurons, uh, F times N excitatory neurons, and 1 minus F times N uh, inhibitory neurons. And uh, so the point is here that the weights of the E neurons are going to be positive or non-negative, I guess. And uh, the, the weights of the I neurons are going to be non-positive. And we want to look for the constraints of this network to have stable dynamics. Okay. And so uh, by following uh, a, a few uh, constraints that are physiologically motivated, we can show that indeed this, this network can have um, a, a stable sort of zero state so that it'll only really respond if, if there's inputs presented to it and it'll um, be sort of near silent otherwise, okay? So first of all, if the input to each neuron is balanced, this is uh, a, a very common assumption in the study of neural networks, the assumption that the, the net input to a single neuron is, is balanced. Um, in that the, the, the sum of the weights into it are equal to zero. So that means the excitatory weights and the inhibitory weights cancel out. The next is that excitatory weights are drawn from just some distribution with some mean that's greater than zero and a variance um, that's given by R over N. Okay, so, so as the size of the network grows, the, the mean of the weights is gonna decrease uh, according to the um, one over the square root of n, and the variance is going to scale like one over n. Okay, so so as you add more and more neurons, then you're not having um, more and more variability overall in the network. Okay, a similar assumption on the uh, inhibitory weights: variance that scales like one over n, mean that scales like one over square root of n. And what we find uh, in this case is if we use these three assumptions. What we have is that the uh, eigenvalues of W all lie in the unit circle. Okay, so the real part is bounded between minus one and one. So what does that mean? If well, if I look up at the eigenvalue equation up here, if G prime is zero and uh, minus I basically shifts eigenvalues to the left by one, we have that none of the eigenvalues can have real part greater than zero in in the full eigenvalue equation. Okay. So they all have negative real part and they're stable. If, however, we, we break one of these assumptions, okay, uh, we, we can have uh, eigenvalues that lie outside of the unit circle. Okay, so uh, maybe, maybe we debalance the system a bit, maybe we have slightly more excitation than we have inhibition, okay. Um, and in this case, we have an unstable network. So, so the dynamics are not gonna hover around zero, but they're gonna sort of bounce around wildly, okay, according to some high, high dimensional chaos. And if we have such high dimensional chaos in a network, okay, it turns out we can train the weights of the network or, or just readouts uh, from the network to some, to some readout neuron, 
okay, to uh, produce trajectory z that are now going to be functions of time. So again, remember in your homework when you're looking at feedforward neural networks, we're always looking at sort of static readouts. Here we're talking about dynamic readouts. Here we're talking about the case where z can be a function of time or a multivariate uh, function of time. And uh, this uh, work was developed, as, as we talked about, by others like um, Moss et al. And, and previous authors. Um, but really, there's an influential paper that actually some of you are looking at for your project by Cicillo and Abbott uh, that looked at uh, different ways of training recurrent neural networks to produce sort of some desired readout. And one architecture that they considered is one where uh, you have a recurrent neural network represented by the, the yellow circles inside of a big black circle there, where the all of the neurons activity is wet, read out according to some weight vector w onto some uh, readout neuron z. And then that readout is then re-injected into the network. Why do you do that? Well, it actually it helps to stabilize the dynamics of the network. And the idea is that you're going to train this weight vector w so that it produces the, the readout z as a function of time that you want. Okay. Another architecture that they considered is one where you have, again, a, a readout vector w. And you also have some uh, readout matrix jfg that feeds into some um, side pool of neurons s. And uh, that's then re-injected back into the, into the network. So the idea is that you, you train some additional readout to, to maybe further help stabilize the network. Uh, and then there's also a version of this network where you actually train the recurrent weights within the network, so JGG, okay? They looked at all of these. Of course, the, the easiest one to do is, is the top, okay? Um, but, but the bottom is probably more like what happens in the actual brain, actually always the, the recurrent uh, synapses of all networks are constantly changing, okay, uh, if only slightly, okay. So what did this network do? Well, uh, in particular, they were interested in training these networks to do things like produce motor readouts, okay. So imagine um, if you're walking, you sort of want to produce uh, a periodic pattern of muscle actuations, or if you're running, okay, um, or if, if you're doing, you know, something re repetitive, okay, or you, you even something non-repetitive, you may have some, you know, repetitive muscle actuations involved, playing a sport or something like that. And so they wanted to look at sort of really training dynamics and doing something that uh, pure feedforward networks are, are just not very good at doing. And so they looked at uh, training the network so that Z really just produced this um, down, up, down, up, down, up, sort of repetitive uh, uh, pattern, okay? When initially Z was producing this sort of spontaneous, messy looking activity. And so what they did is they used, again, some supervised learning, basically a, um, a gradient descent algorithm on the error uh, between Z, uh, Z, the true Z and the desired output. And they found that initially the weight vector sort of changed a lot. So that's represented by the yellow uh, uh, spiky looking curve on the bottom. But you see over time, eventually the, the weight vector sort of stops changing very much. And then the second gray vertical bar here represents the end of training. And then after learning, the network really just produces this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, a red trajectory, Z, uh, that they wanted it to. Okay. But that's not the only thing these networks can do. They can also produce sort of more nuanced uh, periodic patterns. This is one where we basically just superimpose a higher frequency sign uh, function on a, on a lower frequency one. Okay. Here's another one where we just have a, a discontinuous uh, time series that's maybe controlled by an external input coming into the network. And another uh, super interesting result is that they were actually able to train in dynamics uh, that resembled uh, a, a cut through the trajectory of the Lorenz attractor. So if you haven't looked at the Lorenz attractor, um, it's a solution to uh, a three-dimensional system of nonlinear dynamic uh, differential equations. And the uh, 
the the reason that people are very interested in it is is that it's an example of a chaotic trajectory, where if you if you perturb it uh, by some small amount, okay, then in in the long run the the dynamics of the trajectory will start to spread apart from the original trajectory. And so, uh, so you're actually training some low dimensional chaotic system into a higher dimensional chaotic system. And because the Lorenz attractors dynamics are very, very fragile, it's surprising that um, even, in, even in a high dimensional system, you're able to uh, train this in so that it sort of stays with the true trajectory long enough. So the green trajectory is the, the true desired trajectory and the red trajectory is actually what you get post-learning. And it sort of stays with the green trajectory for a while, but then leaves it. But even after it's left the green trajectory, you can see that it uh, really mimics the, the types of dynamics that you see um, in the Lorenz attractor. Um, it's a very cool result. Uh, lots of people are continuing to look at um, things like this and many, many extensions of training uh, recurrent neural networks. But the basic basic ingredients are that you have some high dimensional dynamical system uh, that that can uh, produce some some high dimensional trajectory, typically a chaotic one, and uh, and then that you either train uh, a readout or a recurrent set of weights so that uh, the the readout neuron or readout neurons produce things uh, that that uh, produce basically some temporal trajectory that you would like to see. Um, and one of the interesting uh, things that they looked at in the Cicillo and Abbott paper was really taking data from movement trajectories of people uh, running in uh, in a, a, a like a, a motor learning lab at Carnegie Mellon University, and they were able to train uh, a a neural network to reproduce the the trajectories of I think uh, dozens of of um, uh, sp spatial sensors uh, that were placed on people's bodies while they were running and walking and actually have the network sort of switch between running like trajectories and walking like trajectories. All right, so that's that's it for this reservoir computing uh, lecture. Uh, if you're interested, you can look more at the Cecilio and Abbott paper. They also have code. Uh, again, I know some of you are working on projects like that, so um, uh, if you're interested uh, in, in that and you're not working on this project, you can sort of wait and hear from those folks towards the end of the semester. All right.